so it was like this. Our fraternity always did the craziest initiations. Right. We get two newbies in the group. Time to haze. You know. Well, usually it involved flagpoles or doing something stupid and humiliating. Instead, one of the guys in our group, Justin, he decides we should induct them by taking them to a haunted house. Since it's so close to Halloween, we all thought that it'd be neat. Since the Render House was only five miles off campus, Render House was a four-story half-mansion with this distinct style. Looked just like those haunted houses from the old movies. Bizarre murder-suicide happened there. Creepy dad stabbed his wife and broke her neck. Strangled all his kids, except his daughter, and then threw himself off the roof. The little girl made it out of the house. A seeming survivor, only to get hit by a semi-trailer. Since those days, only two other families have lived there. A couple who was supposed to have got so scared they left the house before even gathering their things, and drove off to the other side of the country. Movers never described any problems. They died 15 years later. In California, both of heart attacks. There was another family. Those kids are in foster care. Because this time, the mother poisoned the father after he got abusive. Then she attempted killing herself by throwing herself off the roof. She survived and lives in an asylum. We decided we'd send them up the stairs with pocket knives and candles. And what did they do is scratch their names into the walls of every room in the house. Lots of other guys done that. Places abandoned and graffiti all over the walls anyway. But I don't think anyone's ever gone up to the fourth floor to do so which will be interesting for them. Then we thought we'd make them go up to the attic, open the windows, and yell out, Coke. That's when we'd uncover the doors for them and let them out. Alex and Timothy were their names. We drove them out blindfolded to the house and gave them their instructions. So you go in. You got the dining room, kitchen, sunroom, first bathroom and living room on the first floor. Carve your names into a wall on every room. Cause we're checking tomorrow. Second floor. There's the library. Study. First kids room. And the second bathroom. There's a closet there but that won't count. Third floor. You have another bedroom. The master bedroom. A second study. Third bathroom. And the music room. Fourth floor has the storage room. Last bedroom. Final bathroom and entrance to the attic. Once you're done, enter the attic, and scream out the attic window, Coke. Let me tell you some history about this place. So in 1985, you got the Albersons, and Jackson, the dad, he goes insane, and kills everyone except the daughter. Specifically, his wife in the master bedroom. He stabbed her, broke her neck, then slit her throat. Then he strangled the boy and the youngest daughter, who was only four. The nine-year-old daughter escaped, and he climbs out the attic and throws himself from the roof. The nine-year-old steps out onto the road and gets hit by a trucker. Funny thing is, the house remained vacant for five years, and the new residents, a couple, settled in. This trucker supposedly died in an accident three days after this couple settled in. They stayed for a while until moving out cause the place was haunted. They were found dead in their house in California. In 2005, both of heart attacks. Finally, you got the Jefferson family. A month after settling in, they all got wrong in the head. They had two kids, a 13-year-old boy and 14-year-old girl. That father, he started beating his kids. He spent all his time in the study. And if they ever interrupted him, well, it wasn't pretty. Eventually, he got so bad, he hacked off his son's right hand fingers and locked him in a closet. The girl told the mom, and the mom poisoned that guy's food. Then she tried to throw herself from the roof, but only paralyzed herself. They keep her locked up now. Be good, cool, get moving, quote. They walked inside with their candles. And then Jeffrey and I blocked the doors. Don going to the other side and blocking the kitchen door. 
we realized that if they wanted out, they could easily break a window and climb out. But we hoped they wouldn't be that clever. And then, they'd lose any chance of ever getting into the group. I couldn't tell what was going on for a while. We waited for about 10 minutes. When one of them, sounded like Alex, opened up a window on the third floor and yelled out, My candle's out. Quote, I called up. Keep going. Stay with Tim if ya have to. Quote, He's already on the fourth floor. Quote, Well I'd hurry then. He might finish without you. Quote, Sounded like he closed the window and cursed. Grant and I decided to switch places. I decided I'd go pop a smoke by the truck. Waited for two minutes. And heard off in the distance Grant yelling up to Alex about forgetting Tim and doing what he had to do. When I walked back, Grant told me that Tim wouldn't answer to Alex's calls. Nor could Alex find him on the fourth floor. I reassured Grant that Tim was probably planning on scaring Alex down the stairs to keep him from joining, cause they didn't get along well. About three minutes later, we hear a crash and we hear screaming. Eventually, Alex comes screaming about Tim and bangs on the doors. We couldn't make out exactly what he was saying. But finally he starts screaming. Let me out. Let me out, damn it. Fuck. Let me the fuck out. Quote, we keep blocking the doors. And he screams even harder. Something about finding Tim. Oh, did Tim scare ya? I called in. Fuck it man. Listen to me. He's. That was as far as he got. He stopped banging. And we couldn't hear a thing. Not a single sound. I looked at Grant for a moment. He looked at me for a little while before asking. What the hell just happened? Quote. It's worth checking out. I said. We grabbed flashlights and heavy-duty lanterns from the truck and opened up the doors. Alex was nowhere in sight. Jeffrey told us he'd check the first floor to see if they carved. While Don, Grant, Justin, Bob and I checked the floors. We started calling them out. And got no answer. The place was dark. Really, really fucking dark. We creeped up the stairs. Faded green wallpaper on the sides with some old portraits. The stairs made really loud creaks. And eventually Don had said, Let's just get out of here. They're pulling a prank on us. Quote, You want to go, be my guest, I said. But that sounded genuine to me. Something bad happened. I got a really bad. Yeah, it's all here. Jeffrey called from the first floor. I'll come up to check the next floor. As we circled around, we began to see the interior design. Bob decided he'd check rooms with Jeffrey, and momentarily disappeared into the dark. We circled around the stairs, floorboards getting increasingly creaky, and things that sounded like whistling, most likely the wind, were entering our ears. We slowly climbed the stairs, and eventually Don had admitted his fear. Maybe we should have just done something else. I'm freaking scared, man. Quote. Justin pulled around and told him, Are you a little bitch? Get a grip. None of us are scared like you. Be a man. Or get back to the car. Justin was a big fucking hypocrite. Of course. All of us. All of us. Were scared. Even him. As we made it to the third floor. Bob called up. You guys should check this out when you're done. Some of this graffiti is. Omen like. Quote. As we reached the top. We discovered Alex's candle. We picked it up, and began circling the next set of stairs. The floorboards got even more creaky. And then, bitch, quote, my eyes widened. I turned to the rest of the group. The voice was faint, and very deep, but angered. Who the hell just, Justin looked at me with pure terror in his eyes. Nobody said a thing, quote, I looked back and forth at him. Let's finish up. We need to find them. Quote, Jeff and Bob called up that they would check the third floor. We made it to the top of the fourth floor. And we discovered Tim's shoes. Gray Nikes. And a trail of, fuck, fuck, oh fuck, oh my fucking god. Was all Grant could say. Justin and Don were left speechless. I began following the trail. And Justin said, are you freaking nuts? Let's get the fuck out of here. 
Justin began running down the stairs. And I heard Jeff mumbling about seeing him running. Grant and Don looked at me. Andy I said, we need to find them. Guys, come on. Quote, I walked, following a fading trail of what we could only guess was blood. The attic stairway was a pull-out ladder style step. It was yanked down, and we swore we heard another voice scream in anger. Followed by a crash, Jeff yelled up, Are you guys all right? Quote, We're fine. Where's Justin? I yelled. He and Bob drove off in the truck. I've got the keys to my sedan. Still, but they were in one fucking hurry. Quote, Head down to the car. And get it started. We'll meet you down there. Quote, Gotcha. Quote, We began going one at a time up the attic. I was first. I peeked my head up. And there were several crates and objects littered around. And a candlestick. At the end was a broken window. I slowly started crawling up. Left hand clutching flashlight. Right hand touching the floor. When I felt a thick liquid. Oh fuck. I whispered. Grant whispered to me. What is it? Quote. I shined my flashlight on it. And nearly puked up. It's fucking blood. Quote. God. Quote. Don started mumbling uncontrollably, and Grant and I started climbing up. We finally made it up to get a full view of the attic. No one. I called out their names. And got no answer. In the middle, the trail of blood led to a small pool. Which ended there. Don started talking to himself. And I told Grant to calm him down. Grant started stepping down. When he suddenly stopped, I asked from above. What the hell's going on? Quote, Grant and Don started screaming and ran down the stairs. I could only hear the crash of their flashlights breaking and the thumping of their dashes down. The stairs. I turned and my light suddenly clicked off. I aimed towards the exit ladder. Flashed my light on again. And I was flashed immediately with the most horrific face I had ever seen. The palest, whitest face with the emptiest blackest eyes and largest, darkest mouth I had ever seen in my life. It sped up the exit, and I fell on my hands and knees, and closed my eyes for what felt like an hour. When I finally opened them, nobody was there. Jeff was calling from the doorway to hurry the fuck up, and that he was calling the cops. I began slowly down the stairs, flashing my light at every room. Not seeing a single thing. I made it down the stairs. When Jeff led me to the truck, we drove back to campus and to our frat house. Only to find that Justin and Bob weren't home. At midnight we decided it was too late. And hit the bed. The morning after, the cops arrived and asked about the disappearances of two freshmen who had, according to friends, expressed interest in our fraternity. They told us their names were Alex and Timothy. I told them the honest story, and we were all asked to be brought in and questioned. The week after thorough investigation led to nothing, and the only thing I learned was that Bob and Justin were found in a car crash. Justin was killed, and Bob suffered serious injuries, which was deemed unrelated. Apparently, trace amounts of alcohol were found in Justin's blood, and Grant had later admitted to drinking that night. So it was finally concluded that they had been driving under the influence and crashed into a tree. Grant, Jeff, Don, Bob and I were never charged with any crimes. But the school suspended us all for three weeks. Bob had told us after he got out of the hospital that the tree was where they landed. Bob had admitted to, during Justin's drive, arguing with him about leaving us behind. Justin turned his head to argue without watching the road, and Bob noticed a little girl across the road. They hit her, and the impact caused Justin to lose control, resulting in the lethal impact of the tree. He told us he realized exactly what was going on, and he knew how the stories went, that we were cursed, just like the first and second families, just like the couple, and no matter where we went, we were going to die. I didn't want to believe this at first. But sure enough, that mother who poisoned her husband died in an asylum, apparently by throwing herself from the roof. Her two kids, the boy, 
now in his late 20s, was supposed to have died from a drug overdose. The girl died after hanging herself. Seemed like a coincidence. Tragic. Maybe the trauma finally got to them. I wanted to believe that. Except in 2010. Bob died after being hit by a semi-trailer leaving a roadside bar. That November, Jeff died after stabbing himself and somehow suffocating. In 2011, Don and I reunited at a bar to hopefully stay together and put an end to the curse. Maybe to survive it, we needed Grant, and we concluded we'd need to get a hold of him. Grant had flown as far as far as Japan to hopefully save himself from this curse. It didn't. At that same bar after concluding what we needed to do, a pair of hands grabbed Don's wine glass, smashed it, and slashed his throat. Everyone else had witnessed it as him doing it himself. In 2012, Grant was found dead in a Japanese restaurant, dying of a heart attack attributed to food poisoning. I'm the last one left. And I'm writing this story to hopefully keep a record of events and warn people of this house. I've been starting to feel funny. Sounds like my girlfriend's home. I hear her coming up the steps. Well, I've got what's coming to me. I guess, if it happens in a year, or it happens right now makes no difference. -y.